here we are, episode 24, and for all our two guys playing Zelda fans, this is the episode for you. All Hell episode yeah. long, we are talking Breath of the Wild, one of the best Zelda, well, it depends who you ask, <laughs> even <laughs> if you ask us, we don't even think it's the best, but one of the better games I think most fans would agree, like one of the yep. better Zelda games in the franchise, but we've already had an episode where we talked basically all Zelda, kind of went through all the games, but this one we're just going to focus on Breath of the Wild because last week Red chose that one over Ocarina of Time. Not going <laughs> to lie, I was a little bit upset about that, but anyways, we will talk about Ocarina of Time someday, but yep. today is not that day. Hey, but we probably have fans about- out there who've never even played Ocarina of Time because <laughs> yeah, they're a little younger, yeah, so true. we well, had to go with a little more modern game. <laughs> we're going to talk about the world, the gameplay, story, done. Dungeons, if you want to call them dungeons, yeah, uh, quote, shrines, <laughs> characters, enemies, quests. We're going to talk about all of it. Now, here's the thing, folks. Or the thing, folks. We we kind of went, we went back. We did do some research. We looked up some things. But we played this game three years ago when it came out. Been a while. So we're not going to remember <laughs> every quest. We're not going to remember every shrine. There's like 70, 120, like there's 78 side quests. 42 yep. uh, shrine quests. Uh, I don't know these numbers is spectacular. Um, 120 <laughs> uh, shrines. We're not going to know all of them. We're not going to know all the characters. We're not going to know every single detail of the story. But we did go back. We researched it. We know we know it pretty well. So Red, let's go ahead. I'm going to throw it to you. The one thing that I want to talk about first is just this gorgeous world that we got. Unlike any other world that we got in a Zelda game. What did you think about it? And I think that's really where you have to start with Breath of the Wild, because in my opinion, and I'm pretty sure you agree with me, the world of Hyrule that they created for Breath of the Wild is truly the star of the game. I mean, this game is all about exploration, just exploring this massive, varied, beautiful world that's bigger, obviously, than any Hyrule we've ever gotten. It's bigger than a lot of open world games out there. And first of all, I'm amazed they managed to get this big of a world this beautiful and still make it a relatively small game download yep. mm-hmm. on the Switch. But that's a, that's a whole technical thing that I don't know the details behind, but it blows my mind. But it's a massive world. You've got all these different areas with their own climates, with their own environments, with their own like animals and things. Like To me, it is one of the most fully realized and realistic, not in terms of like graphics, because it's, it's not, let's be honest. Yeah. But realistic in terms of like, night and day cycle weather cycle the, you know the wildlife the plant life it's just and just the varied terrains that you get and the effects that they have on you as a character and we'll get into that a little bit more down mm-hmm. in like the gameplay section but just to me it blew my mind how big and varied this world truly was and like if i have one thing that i necessarily didn't care for is that most of hyrule is in ruins yep. at this point in the game so to me that was like the only turn off yes there were some villages there were some towns but a lot of hyrule was destroyed and like i said we'll talk we'll talk story a little bit later as well so we'll get into that but that was like my only knock on this version of hyrule because let's be honest it was an absolute joy to explore it was gorgeous with the art style that they managed to pull out. It's just, to me, it is probably my favorite, even if it's not my favorite Zelda game, it's probably my favorite version of Hyrule so far. And I'd say a lot of people probably agree with that. But Definitely. So what are your thoughts on just the overworld in general? Well, first of all, I love the terrain. Or, you know, if you watch any of our videos, you know we got to say it in this one. Verticality. verticality. We love the verticality <laughs> of the game. But no, yes. just all the terrain, like, you know, it's just like a lot of mountains. Then there was also just a lot of flat land to kind of run through grass and everything. But just here's the thing about Zelda. Like, all okay, they do awesome with all the different areas. Like, you know, you got yep. desert, you got snow, you got uh, Lake Hylila with the water. You got a forest, which, you know, had plenty of water in it itself in oh, yeah. this game. Then you had Akala, which was like, you know, like a fall full full fall foliage kind of area <laughs> and i think that zelda does that better than or at least breath of the wild did that better than any other open world game i've played yeah in these open world games you do go to different areas like there'll be like some snow oh, yeah. some desert but zelda breaks them up or nintendo breaks them up the best but at the same time also brings them together within a big map if that makes sense you know i know what i'm going for there but they just 
I mean, they could put a desert area right against the snow area, which they kind of did in this game. You had Hebra bit. and then Gerudo, not necessarily right beside each other, but they were close. And yes, they, they just make it work somehow. Like, they're really good. They're a lot better at transitions than we are at transitions, even though <laughs> we are getting better. But we're trying. I'm with, I'm with you, like, right here. I mean, the world was just, I mean, first of all, it was humongous. It was yes. absolutely beautiful. We talked about art styles on the last podcast. So we're not going to talk about a lot on this one, but just the art style they used. And even though it was only like around 900 P that art style still looked beautiful. I mean, just all the water, like just looked fantastic in the game. Yeah. You got waterfalls everywhere. You go to freaking Zora's domain, which I ran through today. Just kind of, you know, literally just run through the game, the map oh, area, so just kind of, you know, reminiscing, but also like, you know, reminding myself of the game, you know, that I played three years ago, but then you got like these little, <laughs> like this isn't okay. This is the world. You got water run down like the side sidewalks, whatever you want to call it, in Zora's domain. Yeah. It's, just, it's one of the most beautiful world games that I've ever played in. Did you have like any regions that were really your favorite in the uh, in Hyrule? Oh, I, absolutely. And I think everyone will kind of have different ones that they consider their favorites, just depending on what you like from yeah. the terrain and, and the environment and all that. But to me, the one that comes to my mind first is the Farron Grasslands region. And that's the region. It's got Lake Hylia. It's got like these deep woods with all like the Zonai ruins in them that look like dragons or serpents. You've got a river that runs like all the way through it. So to me, that was one of the most absolutely stunning sections of the game because Lake Hylia and the Great Bridge of Hylia is, is yeah. just gorgeous and it's massive. And then you get like past that and it's just like this great like jungle area with just a river kind of running through it and all these mysterious ruins which aren't even like they're mentioned in the game like the the tribe or whatever that allegedly built them the zonai aren't Uh even like mentioned in the game like i think it was the uh one of the supporting books that first mentioned them so to me it's like that area just between the lake the jungle and then the the ruins and the history that it seems like is in that area really jumped out to me is like when i think of breath of the wild that is one of the like that is one of the first regions that truly pops to my mind. What were your thoughts kind of on the fair and grasslands? Yeah, first of all, it rained too damn much there. I would have <laughs> loved it if it didn't rain That's so true. much. Like obviously beautiful, but it was even like it was gorgeous when there was sunlight and that light yep. was hitting it because Nintendo did great with the light effects, I think, in this oh, game. Yeah, they which did. was surprising really for the art style and only be at 900p. I thought that was something they might have to sacrifice, but may look beautiful, but they yeah, did. I absolutely love the area. I just didn't go there a lot because it was always <laughs> fucking raining. So, great to beautiful. The Farron Woods is one of my favorite areas in any Zelda game, if it's in yeah. a particular Zelda game. You think back to Skyward Sword, like, you know, it's beautiful. Twilight Princess, you know, it was okay. And then, yeah. well, you didn't have Farron Woods, you had Kokiri Force and Ocarina of Time, but, same, you know, same just that area is naturally, usually beautiful, so... Agree with you. Just it, it rained a little bit too much for me. My favorite you. area in the game was Akala, or I think it's how you say. It. I'm not really sure. I only had three years to learn how one. to say that. But <laughs> just the fall foliage, like I love that stuff. That yes. is my jam. And just getting out there and just seeing all these different colored trees. There wasn't a lot to the area, but well, there was a big dip. There's like there, there's a big valley, which I yeah. absolutely love that because it made you see all those trees and you could see really far in the distance. And then you're going to hit her about 50 times in this podcast waterfalls. It had fantastic, yes. beautiful looking waterfalls. So just absolutely lo- uh, loved running around that area. Now here's the thing. You kind of talked about Lake Hylia. Lake Hylia looked beautiful. It was humongous. It was so underutilized in this oh, game. Like yeah. it was upsetting. Like there was so much more. I don't know exactly how much they could do with Lake Hylia. Yeah. They basically put like a couple of co-rocks around it. I think they had something else in that little island that was within Lake Hylia, but it yeah, was so was underutilized. And something. this is the reason that you need to be able to swim underwater yes. in Breath of the Wild. Hopefully, Nintendo, hopefully we get that in the sequel. <laughs> but um, other than that, Rito Village, I'm not sure exactly what area that was, but Rito Village was absolutely gorgeous. And then it was. the desert areas. We always love the desert area. So Gerudo Desert and Gerudo Highlands. I just absolutely loved going through there those areas. Um, did you have any more that you wanted to touch on? I will say it's funny, for as much as I sit here and talked about loving like the rainforest area and the lake and everything, I loved the Tabantha region and the Hebra Mountains, like up in the yeah. northwest part of the map where like you've got the tundra and the icy snowing mountains. Like I do really love snow areas 
in Zelda games. And I thought this area, there wasn't a lot up there except for like, you know, a few shrines, Koroks, things like that, that we talked about. Yeah. But like none of the main villages were up there, anything like that. But to me, like going and exploring that like snow area, I thought was just a great change of pace. And like the music change when you get in Mm -hmm. that area, like the music fits that region perfectly. So I actually really did like the, uh, like the, the snowy area there in the uh, top left part of the map but I, I will say, I really like that you mentioned Akala or Akala, whatever, mm-hmm. like the Citadel there. Yeah. I thought mm-hmm. was such an interesting location. And it's like the history with it, with it being like uh, the Hyrule's last stand uh, in front of the Calamity. Like it, I really liked like just having this giant fort there. You had like cannons and stuff around it. But to see it invaded by or uh, infested with like uh, guardians and malice and everything, which we'll get to a little bit more when we talk about enemies and stuff. But it, like, I just thought like just anything like that in this world that had that sense of history added something to it. And one other area that I do kind of want to mention that kind of ties into that a little bit as well is actually in the uh, Laneru area, the promenade, like this yes. beautiful, like paved area that was once all built up with pillars and just and it's obviously kind of in a state of ruins like most of Hyrule now. But it's one of those where you look at it and you think about like Roman or Greek stuff that survived all this time. And you're like, wow. What did this place used to be back in the day? That's what you think about when you see that place. Exactly. And it's just gorgeous. And of course, now it's in ruins and it's infected with, uh, I think, Lizalfos are all over that area now. But just just seeing this awesome like thoroughfare or highway, you know, for lack of a better word, a highway, basically going through the Laneru or Laneru area like that was another one of the little areas that uh, that definitely blew my mind, but kind of shifting a little bit from the bigger regions, uh, Hyrule like or this version of Hyrule, like every Zelda game, also had villages in it, and I thought that they did a great job of varying like the villages, and they all felt very distinct and very unique. I know we've already mentioned Zel- uh, Zora's Domain and how beautiful it looked, yeah. but what what were some of your other favorite uh, towns or villages uh, in Breath of the Wild? I'm kind of looking here at the list that we made, basically all of them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed like every single one, really. Kakariko had like, you know, that Japanese slash Asian kind of culture to it. Absolutely yep. loved it. Like that was so new and so unique. And I know that, you know, a Japanese company, Nintendo, produces Zelda, but they really haven't had like, you know, like that Asian culture, like really in their games, that, at least Zelda games, I don't feel like they've done it a lot. So you're right, I absolutely you're right. love that they put that in there. Now it just kind of reminds me of Ghost of Tsushima, which... I've not gotten to play as much as I want to, but you know what? That's not for this episode. No, nope, um, different episode. Yeah, Hitino Village. Um, I just it was a great village. Like I don't know what else to say about that. The characters, the people were fun. The whole yep. town was just fun. Zora's domain looked too. beautiful. Rito Village. You had all those little walkways going up that stone pillar. Like that made that area just awesome. Um, yeah. Goron City. I wasn't huge on Goron City. I wasn't really huge on the whole Death Mountain area. So Goron City, yeah, it was just okay. Um, yeah. You know, I usually like the Gorons a lot, but in this game, I don't know. I don't know if it's like the whole Death Mountain thing. I just didn't really care for the Gorons and their city in this particular game. I've loved in other ones, but not this one. Yeah. Real town, um, that place is absolutely stunning. I ran around yes. there today and like, you know, where the water, where the water goes through like those little waterways on top of the, um, I don't know, buildings or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like there's like, it's got that stone color. That's different colors. It makes the water and like, you know, the buildings just look absolutely beautiful on top. So absolutely love that area. Uh, Lurland village, probably my favorite in the game. Just oh, you get so there peaceful once again, underutilized, underutilized yeah. Nintendo. You had a home run right there and you just didn't use it enough, but just, the peacefulness of that area, and maybe that's why Nintendo didn't use it so much, but just going there and kind of just chilling out was just a ton of fun. Yes. And then lastly, for me, actually, I'm going to take them all red, um, <laughs> the Atari <laughs> Town, and the, uh, I believe it was uh, from the ground up side quest. Oh, Like just yes. going through and building that thing, and then seeing what it becomes in the Akla region, just absolutely loved that whole experience of the side quest, and then seeing the town come together and how beautiful it was. Absolutely loved it. Um, kind of went through really all of them, but oh, do you okay. want to speak on any of them? I will like I I'm also going to quickly hit on all of them as well. Kakariko was great. Of course, it's a staple of Zelda games. You know, you've got the Sheikah in there. Like I said, it had that Asian kind of persuasion to it. I liked 
the waterfall that was right behind Impa's house. Like I just thought it was like the way it was kind of nestled in that little area. Yeah. I thought was very pretty. Hatino Village, I liked how they said it was like the one part of Hyrule that wasn't really affected by the calamity. And I think that's why Hatino Village felt a little bigger, maybe, yeah. than some of the other villages. They're like, yeah, we we didn't get destroyed like most of the most of the country here. Mm-hmm. So I liked Hatino Village, like the fort around it as well was cool. Obviously, that's where we get to build our home uh, for the Hylian homeowner quest. So, you know, Hatino will always have a little bit of a special place just for that. Zora's Domain is just, it's absolutely beautiful. The colors, like the waterfalls, just the fact that the whole thing is shaped like a giant fish. I mean, it is it is an absolutely gorgeous area. Uh, Rito Village, you, you really hit on it, like just climbing around that giant pillar of rock and going like, it's several layers up, which of course makes sense for a bird race like the Rito. Plus, I thought that that village had some of the best like side slash shrine, uh, side slash shrine quests. Uh-huh. God, that was tough to spit out in the entire game. The Rito, of course, were a lot of fun. They were a fun race anyway. Goron City, I'm kind of with you. I like the fire and the lava and all that around Death Mountain and that whole region. But I feel like the Gorons were kind of underutilized a little bit in this yep. game. Like other than... I don't know. Every race kind of had its its time to shine, depending on. You no, know, I think uh, a lot of that might have had to do with you had to have a certain equipment to go up in that yeah. area. So like you like it took me a long time to even get there because I had to yeah. figure out that equipment. So I think you did didn't explore as much of that area as you want to. But go ahead. Yeah. Plus that city kind of or town whatever you know they call it a city, but it was it looked kind of run down and, yeah. and like mm-hmm. it had been destroyed and was kind of like just almost like a shanty town. I just didn't think it looked very attractive compared to some of the other ones. Gerudo Town absolutely nailed it. Like just being out in the desert, but then like you mentioned, the water and the different colors that are out there. Yeah. Absolutely looked stunning. Plus, hey, it's a whole town full of nothing but women. You turn yep. me loose mm-hmm. in there, I'm a happy guy. Yep. But, mm-hmm. And they had a bar too. But exactly. But so it's like Gerudo Town, I just loved having this. It felt big as well. You had the bar in there, like you mentioned. I mean, just like Gerudo Town to me was a very fun area and very pretty for being out in the middle of nowhere um, in the desert, like in the wasteland. Um, Laurelin Village, you you hit it. It's the most peaceful, I think, like of the cities or towns in the game. Massively underutilized, but it was great for going and loading up on like different kinds of like crabs and fish and things yep. like that that you could make your uh, elixirs out of. So I did like it, or, or meals, not just elixirs, but meals as well. So I did like it from that standpoint. Plus, it was just this little seaside fishing village. And I like the theories that are out there that it is the, uh, uh, it's the same as, Oh, what's the opening outset Island from, yeah, from uh-huh. wind waker. Like I like that theory out there. I don't know if I hundred percent buy into it, but it's got a little bit of credence to it. So I really like that. And then, and then Terry town, like you said, just, and we'll talk about side quests a little bit later as well. I know I've said that a few times now, but just like this, the quest to build it up and watching it get built up and then the payoff of the ceremony you get at the end of it. And then the town itself just down in that, like uh, in that little Valley or on that yep. Lake that it's in is just a really pretty area. And just seeing it all come together, I thought was just such a well done uh, side quest. And it just really made that town worthwhile to me. So my only other thing on the worlds here that I really like is how they have a bunch of little Easter eggs to past Zelda games. Yeah. And whether it's like areas that are strict, like straight up taken from past Zelda games, I know we get like uh, the Lon Lon Ranch, we get Arbiter's Grounds, and they're all ruins, of course. Yeah, but, but Arbiter's Grounds get... looks nothing like the Arbiter's right? Grounds in Twilight <laughs> Princess. At least Lon 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 Ranch looks like the one in Ocarina of Agreed. Time. I agree completely. But then you have so many areas that are named after characters. Like I know you've got like the Tingle Islands, and you've got a yeah. couple of like areas that are named after the scarecrows you've got stuff that's named after links awakening characters i mean it's just to me i really love those little throwbacks some of them are a little too like beat you over the head with them but some of them are really well done but is there anything else about the world that you want to hit on before we kind of move on no not really we can go ahead and kind of talk about gameplay because that was huge in this game also and i'm going to start right off the bat you know we've had climbing in other open world games but you know not in everyone so like you know climbing yeah it was huge it was fun we'll talk about that maybe a little bit more but the one thing, the one thing that set this game apart from other open world games was the paraglider, man. That thing <laughs> yes. is absolutely humongous. And as I played other open world games, like I just get mad. Like even if I love them, like <laughs> The Witcher 3, I just get mad that they don't have a paraglider because 
it came in handy so much. Like, hey, Game changer. you're on top of a mountain. You want to go here? Well, I don't have to walk all the way down. I can just glide there. So that mechanic, that was absolutely humongous. Obviously, yep. I think they got the idea from uh, Skyward Sword and kind of the cell cloth. Oh, but probably, just that yeah. game, I mean, that really changed the game. Like I said, climbing was a big deal, but we've had climbing in other games like Assassin's Creed. Um, a lot oh, of those games, sure. if not all those games, have climbing in them. So that's a mechanic that we've seen before, but that paraglider mechanic, we've not seen that at all. So I absolutely love those two things. Um, kind of what did you like so far as gameplay in the game? Well, I think the climbing and the paraglider are definitely two of like the most exciting for, yeah. for Zelda fans. Like you said, I know we've had parkour and climbing and that kind of thing in Assassin's Creed style games, but to finally get it in a Zelda game and where you could literally climb almost any surface in the yeah. entire game, I thought was a huge deal. The paraglider, I love from the first time they showed it off in like a, a, a teaser video, like before the game was even released, because not only is it great for traveling and getting down from, like you said, mountains or, or high areas, but you can also do like you can drop bombs from it. You can yep. like do uh, like a, a pound the ground type moves from it with your weapons. Like the way it was integrated was just so seamless. And really, at the end of the day, that's what the gameplay for Breath of the Wild came down to me was that just anything you could imagine doing, you almost could do. Yeah. Like they built the engine Except for pet this animals. Game. You couldn't pet animals. Except <laughs> petting animals. Yes. You can't pet all the animals, unfortunately, but like, it's just one of those where the engine is so well done yeah. that you can do just about anything that you like. Oh, maybe I can go cut down those trees. Oh, guess what? It works. You know, maybe I can do like wind effects or like, you know, you light grass on fire and you get an updraft. I mean, the, the engine to me, Beyond just the art and the art style and everything, but just the underlying mechanics in this game, I thought were mind boggling. Just the freedom you had. And it literally was, oh, I think I can do this. Oh, shit. I really yeah. can do this. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it, it blew my mind that they were able to integrate the world with your actions so well. Like other games, you're like, okay, yeah, you run into a tree. You can't cut it down. You know? Yeah. Breath of the Wild, get, you could clear a fucking forest if you want yep. to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just... And build Tarry Town while you're at it. Yeah. Or Tarry Town. <laughs> you almost, have to, you you almost <laughs> have to to get enough wood to do that. But yeah. So so to me, just the underlying engine just really blows my mind. And, and then kind of built on top of that is like the weather cycles and the day and night cycle. Like, yeah. I like... It, Okay, I think we can both agree that it probably rains a little too much in this game. Oh, everybody but, agrees on that one. Yeah, but it's just like the fact that whether it's rainy or sunny or it's day or night means you had different enemies, you had different animals, you had different plants out. Like it just, the detail that went into this, and that kind of overlaps with just the world in general. The detail in this world blew my mind. I mean, you see stuff like when it starts raining and the side characters all start running for cover. Yep. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, it's like when evening time is rolling around, they all start heading back to their villages or their shelters. So yeah. just like the underlying mechanics, it's like it took the concepts of like a clock town or something where everyone's kind of on a schedule and like cranked it up to a million and they absolutely nailed it. So what about combat, though? Combat is a huge part of gameplay. What did you think of the combat in Breath of the Wild? First of all, the weapons broke too damn quickly. That, that's my, like, <laughs> one of my main complaints with the game. But overall, yeah. I just love the combination of like all the weapons that you could get, all the different shields, the swords, and then some of them yeah. are like. Didn't they have this with spears and stuff in the game too? What's that? Did, they had spears like and stuff too. It wasn't just oh, all spears, swords, spears, right? Yeah, spears, tridents, that kind yeah, of stuff. Tridents. Yeah, tridents. Yeah, I thought so. But you know, you had that. Yeah, so we got a uh, sword, spears, tridents. Um, you got the bows. You got the shields. So I mean, there was so many different things and what yeah. that did was it may it allowed you to fight enemies so many different ways like you've seen people in all these videos out there like doing certain things a certain way and it just it's so cool because a lot nintendo has even said we didn't plan on people doing things this way oh but yeah people <laughs> thought of it and that's what happens when you combine like all these different elements into yeah. the combat like you can have all these different things that happen and you can have different ways to go about things so I thought the combat really was like, you know, rock solid as I use the exact words from your outline. Oh, it's okay. Uh, but, uh, like, no, I, I really did That's think it was rock for. solid. I thought all the use of the weapons was, you know, just really great. And then here's the thing. Okay, let's talk about some of these uh, Sheikah Slate runes. Um, yeah. I, I liked them. I, I think, I, for the most part, I did like them. You know, Stasis, Magnesis, Cryonis, and I think I'm missing one. Um, can't uh, uh, the bombs. The, the, the bombs. bombs. I, yeah. Um, but I did like those. 
I thought it, like you know contributed to some like you know good puzzles. We used them a lot in the shrines. We used them oh, a lot yeah. throughout the games. And like I said, going back to the shrines, it was how we solved a lot of the puzzles. I think I might just Most of repeated them. myself on that one. But anyways, oh, you know, it's okay. not the first time <laughs> I've repeated myself on a podcast. But I don't know, man. I really liked them. Like I, I think Magnesis was my favorite one. I didn't use stasis a lot, you know, except except when it was necessary. A lot yeah. of the tricks that are online and in videos actually use stasis for most of those tricks. Um, Cryonis, oh, it's crazy. Cryonis just pisses me off, man, because I didn't know exactly <laughs> how to use it. I didn't know that you could use it on the Va Ruta boss. So oh, that would, no. you know, it's cool. You use water to make ice. Okay, fun. But I just didn't know how to use it. I didn't know when you could use it. So, Cryonis, <laughs> I need a better guide. I need more detail. You need to tell me exactly how to use this. <laughs> Nintendo, you should have gave me a guide or something, damn it. I want to be guided sometimes. Everybody yes. just wants to go and go wherever they want to. I want to do that for the most part, but you got to understand when I'm not going to know something. And how you do that, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, just tell please me. figure just it tell out. Me. And like, tell me if I don't know how to use something, help me out a little bit on it. But um, what was your feeling on the uh, Sheikah Slate runes? I'm, I'm kind of torn on this because I do like the fact that they gave you all those tools basically at the very beginning of the game. You get all your runes, yeah, except mm-hmm. for like the camera you get a little later on, but whatever. Like you get everything within the first couple hours of the game. So having those tools and then just being thrown out into the world and said, yeah, go, go do your thing. Like it is refreshing and it's freeing and it gives you like that freedom to really play the game the way you want to. I do kind of miss the traditional items though. I miss having the hook shot. I miss having you know, a spinner of course would be nice, you know, yeah. things, mm-hmm. things like that. But I think, uh, you know, the fact that we still had a bow, you still had your boomerangs in terms of like your weapons, it kind of alleviates some of that. I do miss kind of having those items that you get in a traditional dungeon that help you beat that dungeon. We'll get into a little bit that a little bit when we talk about the uh, divine beasts, but you know, I liked the freedom of just getting all those items or all those runes, I should say up front and then being thrown out and said, go play the game. However the hell you want. And yeah, you get to upgrade them a little later in the game, which is awesome. But yeah, I was just, so I support it. I, it, it was kind of like the next evolution of a link between worlds approach where you could just kind of rent whatever items you wanted from the beginning. So I was on board with it. I, I really liked the idea and the freedom that it gave you. Part of me misses the, uh, the, like I said, the getting a dungeon specific item, but all in all, I think the runes were the right way to go. Now we have hit on a couple of our annoyances with the gameplay. We said, you know, the weapons can tend to break a little too quick. Climbing when it's raining is a pain in the ass. Yeah, you can load up on like a speed elixir and stamina and still kind of do it, but it's such an annoyance. And how about lightning? When you're wearing or carrying any metal and you're in a lightning area, which there's a few of them throughout the game, Mm -hmm. you get struck by lightning. So those were kind of my the few annoyances that I truly had with the gameplay. But I know you mentioned the weapons, things like that, but was there anything else in terms of gameplay that kind of got under your skin or that you didn't like? No, I mean, the lightning strikes, you could just change your outfit. Like, even though it was a pain in the butt to do, you could, like, help that situation out. How Nintendo never released any uh, outfits in the DLC that allowed you to climb while raining. That was just a missed opportunity. I would have paid 20 bucks for that (laughs) DLC because that's how bad it pissed me off. So the fact that we never got anything or could earn anything that would allow us to climb in rain, just a huge missed opportunity, Nintendo. But let's kind of get away from the gameplay and let's kind of talk about the story. Even though this... We both don't really care for the story too much. In yeah, this game, we don't spend but, um, too much time on it. You know, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I mean, it was weak in our opinion by uh, Zelda standards. But kind of go into the story. I mean, I don't know. Don't go into it too much because most people probably know what the story is. But kind of yeah. just what are your overall opinions of the stories, like the memories, and just how it played out throughout the game? You're totally right. We're I think we're on the same page in ter- in terms of story. It's just to me. The backstory for Breath of the Wild is great. I love the backstory. It's like, you know, the Sheikah created these beasts and guardians to fight Ganon. It was a successful like 10,000 years ago. But then, you know, just 100 years ago, Ganon comes back, takes over the champions or takes over the beasts, kills the champions, takes over the guardians and basically destroys Hyrule. Like that backstory to me is actually pretty fun yeah. and pretty exciting. Um, but then once you actually start the game, nothing happens. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. literally, you, you get off the great plateau, the kind of the tutorial area and they say, yeah, go beat Ganon. That is your quest. Maybe go free the four divine beasts. If you want to, yeah. you don't even have to do it. Like, so to me, every going back as far as link to the past, almost every Zelda game has had like phases 
or yeah. stages to it. Like Link to the Past had Light World, Dark World. Ocarina of Time had, you know, Child Link, Adult Link. Twilight Princess had, you know, the beginning where you're getting the, the uh, oh my God, I just blanked. The few shadow and then yeah, you're repairing yeah. the mirror. <laughs> Sorry. Like is the Skyward Sword had its phases too. So to me, it's just like, I was very disappointed with the story itself once you actually started the game. Like I said, the backstory, fantastic, yeah. very interesting. But, and I'm kind of do, do some uh, wishful thinking here, I wish the first half of the game would have been you doing the fighting 100 years ago. And you, yeah. and when you, and when you fa- you're trying to help Zelda awaken her powers, you're recruiting the champions, and you fail. Like, yeah. you die. And then the second half of the game should have been what we got. Like, yeah. Hyrule is in ruins Go free the divine beast. Go beat Ganon. You know, so to me, I thought it was. I know that's asking a lot from a game. You basically have to have two versions of Hyrule, like we did all the way back with Ocarina of Time, and yeah. I'm not sure how possible that would have been. So the story, to me, like I said, backstory absolutely amazing. The actual game's plot, I thought, was non-existent. Hey, so. <laughs> man, in Link to the Past, all they did was change the colors. So all you got to do, yeah. <laughs> if you want a different Hyrule, you just have to change the colors. Hey, it um, works. I'm kind of with you, like. The backstory was cool, it was good, but the backstory was the past. And like you said, once we started playing the game, there was really nothing there with as far as plot and stuff. So yeah. I was not a huge fan of the story. I absolutely hated all the memories like being random, which it made sense while they were random. I'm actually yeah. going to bring up something here at the end of the story that I kind of want to talk to you about. But okay. all the memories being random, doing it in any order, if like created a disjointed story. So I didn't it really did. care for that. There was no plot development, kind of like I'm saying, because like you know everything's the past. As we're playing throughout the game, there's nothing really building. It's just find out what happened basically, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. And some of it does apply, you know, today. There's an interesting side plot with the Sheikah and the Yiga. Um, don't really remember that, so I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> I'm just going to address it and say it was there. Um yeah. but here's the thing. I want to kind of bust through the story really quickly, but um, it kind of made me think it. Like, you know, I've, I've had this idea in my mind. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to kind of throw it off top, not off topic, but Red, we don't have this on the outline. I don't know oh, why fine. I feel that I have to talk so much behind the scenes stuff. Just so you all know what's going on, okay? This is off the top of the dome. Yeah. Going so if forward, I'm unprepared, it's your fault. Yeah. Well, I do say it so you kind of can start thinking, but yep. here's the thing going forward. Everybody wants Breath of the, or Zelda to be open world. And I think a lot of these issues come from being open world because it's not... Like your other open world games, like, you know, The Witcher and stuff like that. Like you run through, you fight enemies, but for the most part, there's no dungeon. Like, you know, yeah. there's there's bosses, but there's not like a dungeon than a boss and like, you know, get the items in the dungeon. Zelda is structured a yeah. different way than most of the other open world games that you play. So going forward, do you think Zelda needs to be open world or would it be more beneficial to still kind of be open world, but kind of having sections that you progress through and have phases throughout? I think you can do open world and still have like phases and an actual, like a stronger plot and yeah. dungeons. And I think a link between worlds, and I know occasionally we kind of bash on that game a little bit, even though I, I mean, we absolutely love it. I don't, it, I love it. <laughs> but like it let you it still had the dungeons it still had the items and it let you tackle them in whatever order you wanted like that's where its open world came from and i think yes breath of the wild you could tackle the divine beast in whatever order you wanted if you even wanted to you could ignore them all together but like i do think it needs something to happen to like advance the story a little yeah. bit like Yes, dungeons, I I mean, and you can get to the whole, like, traditional Zelda versus Breath of the Wild. And, like, I, it, it needs dungeons back. I truly believe that. Agreed. And And I know we, we hold up Witcher 3 as, like, a pinnacle of, of open world gaming for a reason. Like, even though it was an open world game, it still had phases to the story. Like, yeah. the beginning, it was like, hey, go investigate these three sightings. And then once you did all three of the, it was like Novigrad, it was uh, uh, Skellige and and the main area whose yeah. name I just. We couldn't off. go Skellige until later in the game. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. But like, it's one of those once you like explore those three areas and do those main three quest lines, then it moved to the next phase of the game. Yeah, and like stuff actually happened. So I would like, I think you can do open world and Agreed. still have your dungeons, still have a plot progression, yeah, you know? And I, I honestly don't think that's the point of Breath of the Wild. And I know we chatted about this on our Discord a little while back, is like, you know, yes, Witcher 3 was setting out to be a cinematic experience. It was, it, it's a strong single-player franchise, all yeah. three games. Whereas Breath of the Wild was just built 
to give people a sandbox to play in. Yeah. And, and and it did an amazing job of that. I mean, like like we talked about in the gameplay, the freedom you have is unbelievable. But I need, I want a little bit more structure to come yeah. to the next Zelda game, whatever, you know, whether it's Breath of the Wild 2, whatever they decide to call it. Um, I just think it needs a little more structure. Bring it back a little bit towards the traditional Zelda experience. Agreed. I'm not saying you need to go all the way back to like a straight Ocarina of Time. Well, linear. I don't think that either. But like I say, like, yeah. you know, you can have, like you said, you can have sections that are pretty much open world. You just yeah. can't go everywhere right off the bat. And that will allow you to progress and kind of tell more of a story and Absolutely. tackle these dungeons. I know people want dungeons out of order. I think Zelda games work better when there actually is an order because, like I said, it progresses you through the game. So you can call us traditional. You can call us whatever you want to. Yes, that's what we are. We yeah. want, we <laughs> like some of the traditional elements. We want some of them back. But anyways, you know, kind of a topic. I don't think, you know, I think this idea, I don't think it worked out too well. Breath of the Wild is not most people's favorite Zelda game. And there's a reason for that. And yeah, yes, I while agree. there are a lot of great things about it, you know, this is probably more for the final thoughts of the podcast. But yeah, anyway, okay. so <laughs> like while there are a lot of great things about it, like people have a lot of complaints because the structure was so different. And let's yeah. kind of go into that structure more and the dungeons. The dungeons <laughs> were really different in Breath of the Wild. We basically I say what dungeons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Four Divine Beasts was what I think served as the dungeons. Some people Agreed. say, you know, the shrines are mini dungeons. Agreed with that, but when you like, we're talking dungeons, I still only think of Breath of the Wild as having four or five, if you want to count. We'll count the DLC. They have five uh, dungeons in the game. But yeah. um, for me, I'm going to go ahead and say it right off the bat. I'm with you. I want traditional dungeons back. I was not a fan of the Divine Beast, even though I did have fun with the Divine Beast. Yeah. Overall, as a Zelda fan, I thought they could have been better. Um, you know, like they weren't, they were, um, <laughs> you know, I kind of, I was looking at the notes. I didn't know where I wanted to go next, but, um, yeah, it was cool that you could tackle them in any order, you know, it wasn't linear, but at the same time we kind of talked about like, you know, the difficulty didn't go up at all. Like, you know, you could, go, you could go to any of them first. And so they were all basically the same difficulty. Yeah. You didn't get any items, you know, you could go back and forth if you really need that in a Zelda game. Like I said, a link between worlds. Didn't do that, but I'm going to kind of get off yeah. of it and let you talk about for a little while. What was your overall opinion on the dungeons or Divine Beast in the game? They, they were a disappointment at the end of the day. I mean, they, they all looked the same. None of them had a good distinct feel or appearance or theme mm -hmm. or music or anything. Like, to me, they all blended together, except, like, you could manipulate each, each of the Divine Beasts you could manipulate in a different way. Like you could move like, so Varuta, the elephant, you could move the trunk Uh Vodnaboris, the camel, you could rotate the discs to get the electricity flowing. Uh, Varudania, the lizard, you could uh, tilt it like 90 degrees on its side. And then Va Meadow, the bird, it could tilt uh, side to side, not as far as you could with Rudania, but you could go yeah. side to side. Mm -hmm. So like I liked the manipulation and it, it made each one at least have something of a unique feature to it. But at the end of the day, I thought they were a massive letdown. They barely yeah. had any enemies in them. The puzzles almost entirely revolved around opening up a door to activate a terminal. And like to yeah. me, they were repetitive. They were just generally boring the way they looked, especially on the inside. The the, the musical themes for all of them were very disappointing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and to me, the thing that stood out the most about each of them was not even the beast themselves. It was the approach. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. the approach to the beast, I thought that each one had kind of a unique way that you got to it and you got into it to tackle it. And, and to me, that really stood out because even when you look at the bosses, yeah, they all had different attacks and they all yeah. looked a little different. But in general, the four uh, Blight Ganons, you know, you had Water Blight, you had Thunder Blight, Fire Blight, and Wind Blight were yeah. all just repetitive as well. So like I said, the high point for me was honestly the approach yeah. to each of the dungeons. And, and I'm hundred percent with you. I want to go back to a more traditional, you know, every dungeon is distinct and different and either has a theme or matches the area it's in or something. But let me, what do you think about the divine beasts? I agree with you on most of that. Like the inside was very, yes, it was different, but overall it's very similar. The bosses were very similar. The yeah. themes were very similar. So all three of those things 
to me, were just a humongous letdown. Now, I kind of agree with you beforehand, like getting to the Divine Beast. You know, you're riding on Sidon's back, you know, breaking those uh, ice blocks or whatever. Um, yep. And then in the uh, desert, you ride sand seals. And then uh, oh, that was a fun uh, one. Death Mountain <laughs> and Va Rudania, you were shooting Unobo, uh, or whatever his name was, you know, yeah. up to like hit Rudania. And so, like, and also the bird. Like, you know, you're up in the air, you're using your paraglider, uh, shooting uh, something. Um, something you had can- yeah, you had cannons that you were shooting. So, those were all very good, but then yeah. once you got into the Divine Beast, there just wasn't a lot, and that's why we're not going to talk about a lot because they were all so yeah. similar. You all have heard it; most of you have heard us because we, you know, we got a lot. Of, we got a large Zelda audience. Yeah, like just yeah, yeah give me the traditional dungeons back. If that it makes me a traditionalist, I don't care. That's how yeah. I feel. <laughs> but um, yeah, just not just not a fan. Now I will disagree with you on one thing. I actually did like quite a few of the puzzles. In the Divine Beast, really? kind of like, you know, turn them different directions and how that played in. I did really like that. But um, one dungeon uh, that was kind of cool, I guess we really didn't talk about the uh, DLC uh, Divine Beast, which actually was my favorite. But kind of the same one. thing again. Like, you know, it looked the same. Um, I liked it the most because I thought the puzzles were a lot better. And then obviously yeah. the boss fight was a lot different. So that was a lot better. So I don't even know what that DLC Divine Beast was called, but it was my I favorite I can't remember one. what it was called either. <laughs> um, but um, let's kind of get to Hyrule Castle. I want to get your opinions on this, because this was more like a traditional dungeon. What are your thoughts on Hyrule Castle? Well, I loved Hyrule Castle. I mean, it, it did feel the most like a traditional dungeon, like you said, but it also still felt like another ruined part of Hyrule, because yeah. it was a castle that had, you know, it had an armory, it had the barracks, it had a library, it had a kitchen, like it had... You know Zelda's room, the throne room, like it had all these traditional areas you would and it expect had a from fucking a castle. theme too, and it had, it actually had a theme that was distinctive and really stood out. Plus, you had you know so many of the guardians, the malice, the enemies in this area. You know, so to me, Hyrule Castle was definitely the best of the you know the quote unquote dungeons because yeah. I thought it mixed a dungeon feel as you were working your way higher and higher towards the sanctum where Calamity Ganon was stuck. But it also felt like a real place. It felt like a real castle. So yeah. it reminds me of some of my all-time favorite Zelda dungeons where it's it's not just a dungeon. It's a part of the world. You know, you think of like Snow Peak Manor is one that always jumps to mind. It's a mansion that they turn yeah. into a dungeon. You know, Snow Peak Hyrule Ruins, Ca- but close. What's that? Snow Peak Ruins. Ah, Snow Peak Ruins, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was a mansion before it was ruins. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you but said like, manor, I think. Oh, I think I did say manor. But <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, go ahead. But, uh, but Hyrule Castle felt that way, too. It felt like a natural part of the world and not just, oh, hey, boom, here's a temple. Go go, yeah. go conquer it. Mm-hmm. You know, so, in you know, not getting into the Calamity Ganon fight too much because, you know, there's not a whole lot to talk about, in my opinion. But, like, I loved Hyrule Castle. You mentioned the theme. So, but what did you think about Hyrule Castle? I mean, I, most of the, my opinions are exact same as yours. Again, um, just yeah. felt like a real place. I keep I stealing all your to, thunder. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> but just going through was a lot of fun, even though it wasn't like you know ruins, obviously from the rest of the game. Um, you didn't get to explore as much of it as I would have liked, but you still did get to explore quite a bit. But you know, it's yeah. one of those things like you know, kind of like you know, summing up the ruins overall. Like, that was one thing that really disappointed me in the game. Because I wanted to see what some of these places were like, like, in their heyday. Yeah. And because of that, it contributed to some places, really overall, not being that big. Like, in The Witcher 3, and not to keep on comparing it to The Witcher 3, but in The Witcher 3, you get Novigrad. Like, you know, a humongous city. Massive city. And, you know, then we get to Breath of the Wild, and Castletown is all in ruins, and there's nothing there. And I'm like, what could this place have been? So, you know, yes, I love Hyrule Castle, but the whole... Ruins thing kind of took away from it a little bit, but still loved exploring it, loved the Me theme, uh, just kind of, you know, loved finding the enemies. You know, there wasn't really any puzzles or anything like that. And then I love getting to the top and, you know, going to the Sanctum and fighting Calamity Ganon. I'm with you. Not going to spend a lot of time on Calamity Ganon. I thought it was a huge disappointment. A Definitely. pretty easy boss to eat, especially a beat. Espe- <laughs> you can't eat them in the game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> especially if you kill the four divine beasts. And yep. then, you know, you beat him, you get Dark Beast Ganon, just one of the worst boss Awful. fights in the game. So simple. I beat him the first time. I believe Same. you beat him the first time. Just really yep. a joke. So how Nintendo did that is disappointing. Like, it's For one sure. of the worst final boss experiences I've experienced in Zelda. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because nope. <laughs> there's really nothing to it. So, But here's what I do want to talk about, and that's the shrines. Yes. This is the the mechanic, of, not mechanic, but... um. 
I guess it feature. is a mechanic in a way, yeah. but this is the one thing of the game. Probably, like, you know, if people ask, what was your favorite thing or new thing about Breath of the Wild? I would say the shrines. Like, you know, these mini dungeons, just absolutely love them. The theme, the theme was, I think, one of the best themes in the game. There were so many of them. It allowed you to fast travel to these different points. But let's get to the me- the meat of the shrines. The puzzles. The oh, puzzles yes. were so much fun and using like stasis basically and some of your weapons to get through these shrines. They were just absolutely a blast. Um, The test of strengths, the uh, blessings, you know, get those out here. We don't care yeah. about those. Get those out here. They're not, they're just filler. And I don't know why Nintendo did that. Like, I know, okay, you can say, okay, we had shrine quests and that was actually the shrine. I don't give yeah. a shit. Give me a shrine quest. <laughs> give me a, give me a shrine with a puzzle. That's what I wanted. And every time I did a shrine quest and then got a blessing shrine, I was pissed off because <laughs> I wanted a puzzle shrine because that's what I love so much in yep. the game. And you all can see how heated I'm getting about it. I love, I love the shrines. I absolutely love the shrines. And so I when too. I got... 120, but there was like 40 fake ones, you know, kind of, or 50, however Ugh, many you want to say. You know, kind of pissed me off, but, you know, kind of what are your overall opinions in the shrines? And I don't think you really want to talk about any in particular, but no. if you do go ahead, but what's your, just, you know, what do you think about the shrines? It, it just, to me, it it, it gave the, the creators like Nintendo a reason or an excuse to have a bunch of different puzzles that they didn't have to fit into a dungeon. Like, yeah. You know, normally you have to have puzzles that fit a dungeon theme or or like a divine beast, you know, with how you manipulate the beast. But the shrines gave them just, they could take their most off the wall, crazy puzzle ideas and just throw it into a room and yeah. say, go, go solve it. It doesn't yeah. have to fit with anything else. And it like, like you, you mentioned the theme for them, the futuristic look. I really liked mm-hmm. like the, uh, the, the kind of like the neon, it was darker with the neon lights. It almost reminded me of the room you fight uh, like Godan in Tower of the Gods, which was a, a test as well, similar to the shrines or a test to earn a spirit orb. So I liked the look to them and you, you hit it right, man. The puzzles, just the sheer variety of them. I mean, you did. We did use uh, like uh, stasis crown. We used all of our our runes a lot, but some of them dealt with electricity, fire, water, wind. I mean, like they hit on all the different things that you could in these dungeons or in, uh, dungeons in the in these shrines uh-huh. throughout the game. And I'm with you. I could have done without the test of strength. I could have done without the blessings. I and I'm not sure how you feel about these. So I'm going to ask you the apparatus shrines. I hated them just trying to use motion controls to move a part of the shrine around was fucking frustrating to, as hell to me what did you think about the apparatus shrines yeah i loved them i'm not gonna lie because <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you remember like there was You're like wrong. that um it might be called like a labyrinth or something but you used to put like a metal marble ball in those like wooden puzzles and like you would move the knobs and yeah. like the ball would go through like you know you try to dodge the holes like this is the actual toy that you could play with yeah, um, yeah, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I do, I do. Um, like that's what the apparatus reminded me of was doing things like that, especially that one that like you know you took the ball through the hole, which was actually a pain in the ass. I don't know why. Yes, it was giving that one credit, <laughs> but no, I really did like them because they were different, and I didn't think the motion controls were that bad. Yeah, I struggled like here and there, but for the most part, I think they were good. I thought it was really different. Motion controls weren't used a lot in the game, so I no, don't really, mind yeah. it when they're used just a little bit. So. Overall, I was a fan of the uh, apparatuses. Um, is there anything else you really want to say on the shrine? I think most people know that we feel very highly of them. I just, I really thought that they gave us a purpose to explore the world. Like it gave yeah. us a great mm-hmm. reason to. I mean, other than the Korok seeds, which you know, whatever. But like, I thought having 120 of them spread throughout the world, a lot of them attached to like, like you said, a shrine quest. Yeah. I thought it gave us a really good reason to explore the world. And it also gave us, I thought, some of the strongest side quests in the game. And yeah. we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But that's really all I had on the shrines. I loved them. I thought it was great getting all those different puzzles in there. And Nintendo didn't have to worry about, you know, shoehorning them into a dungeon somehow. Like, just, hey, this puzzle sounds like a shit ton of fun. Let's make it a shrine. Now, Boom. I will tell you all that we actually did a video of our top 10 shrines. So, we'll put a link down in the description. You can go Hell check yeah. that out. See, We're not going to go through all of them because we'll be here all no. day. But you can kind of check out that video and see which ones we thought were the best. Yeah. But, you know, moving on from the shrines a little bit, you know, all Zelda games have the side characters. They can really either add to the experience or in the cases of some, ugh, looking at a few of them out there, kind yep. of detract mm-hmm. from the experience. But Breath of the Wild was no exception, of course, being a huge open world game. 
there were a lot of side characters. But let's start with, you know, the, the main girl of the franchise. Let's start with Zelda. What did you think of this particular version of Princess Zelda? Well, first of all, I love their hair, man. I thought her <laughs> hair was absolutely gorgeous. So right? when everybody was like all huge on the Breath of the Wild 2 trailer and Zelda's hair being short, I was like, oh, because <laughs> I thought her hair was absolutely gorgeous. But, you know, I like Zelda in this one. I thought it was a good one. Um, I really liked that she had somewhat of a relationship with Link. Like, you know, yeah. it wasn't just Link going like, you know, to save a princess. Like there was actually substance there. So I like that. They gave her more of a personality. Now, I know it's like, you know, a newer game they can do more with characters, but they gave her a little bit of a personality. And we saw that she was like kind of struggling with not being able to get some of these powers. Like, you know, she was trying to go around, you know, find guy. And so overall, I really did like her um, champions like Mimfa, uh, Daruk, Rivali, and Arbosa. Really? I liked all of them. I know a lot of people have a problem with Rivali. I kind of like his cockiness. <laughs> I think it's good for the game. I think it's a little bit something different. He was it different. Reminds me of somebody that I know that lives in this house that is, well, me. It reminds me of me. Um, right. That was kind of going towards my wife. So I kind of <laughs> wanted to stop and clarify who I was actually talking about. Right. I was talking about me. Just his personality, like, you know, in certain ways reminds me of myself, Um, you know, kind of in the more playful manner like you know but yeah yeah overall i was just really impressed with all the champions like their stories kind of like you know their dialogue just overall i was a fan of the champions but what the modern day champions like what did you feel about those i know one that you're going to like probably that everybody liked but overall <laughs> what was your opinion of those four modern day champions i i actually really liked all four of the modern day ones too and i thought that they both kind of uh represented or not both, but all four of them kind of represented almost the opposite of what their their predecessors were. Yeah. So like Sidon was like the brash kind of cocky, co- not cocky. He was just more confident. Yeah. Like he's like he felt like he could take on the world. Like almost that young naive. I can go do all this, and he's got the charisma to him. Whereas Mifa was like very much more like quiet, reserved. So I I love those two opposites. Sidon plus r- like riding his back to take on yeah. Varuda. Was so much fun. Um, you know, both so, Sidon, Sidon was awesome. Everybody knows Sidon was Sidon's fucking awesome. awesome in the game. Everybody <laughs> loved him. Go ahead. His character was just his character was just honestly just a yeah. lot of fun. Like I love Sidon. Like you got the like the flash on his teeth when he smiled. I mean, it was yep. just mm-hmm. it was just a fun character. You know, Bo, I liked like was like like cowardly Goron. It was kind of a direct change of pace. I uh, you know just kind of helping him. Like freeing him and then helping him find his like courage and everything to tackle. And you usually uh, don't think of Gorons like that being cowards. Right. Yeah. So, so I liked Unoba or Unobo. Uh, Tiba, I felt like got the least. Um, cause really yeah. all you did with Tiba was you did the, uh, the Rito training ground and then just tackled the, uh, the divine beast. I love the approach to that divine beast as well. Just using like, uh, using her and then also the parag- uh, paraglider to take out the cannons. But, like, I felt like Tebow was kind of underdeveloped a little bit, especially compared to Rivali, who, like we kind of mentioned, has the most personality, probably, of the four initial champions. And then Riju was great. I love that it was, like, this poor kid that was thrust into this leadership role and just totally, like, a little bit insecure, but still trying to do what's right by her people. Um, Plus, the Gerudo were just a fun race. So, I was on board with all four of the modern-day champions. Sidon is probably the most memorable character in the entire game, but we also had a few other side characters and I think you were a pretty big fan of one or two of these as well. And one that I think we'll both really loved was Cass. Yeah. What did you think? Yeah, was I right? Do you love Cass? No, everybody I think loves Cass, but just him <laughs> playing the songs and I don't remember exact. Like I think you went to him for shrine quest or something like that or whatever, whatever you did. I did like him. I know you also yeah. got some story from him, but overall I think he was a very good character in the game. Absolutely loved hearing his sound. Like, you know, you'd be walk up to an area that he was at and like, you know, you could hear his music. So I absolutely yep. love that. Just talking to him, I thought was fun. Like, you know, conversating. Um, other than that, I mean, Impa was okay. Uh, Pura and Robbie, like, you know, kind of with the uh, Sheikah technology and all that stuff. They were kind of cool. I didn't really have any other memorable ones. Did you have any? And not really. I mean, Master Koga, and honestly, he could kind of fall into the enemies category as well. But I did like Master Koga as like the leader of the Yiga clan just because like all the Yiga that you encounter throughout the game are talking up like what an absolute badass he is he's gonna kill you all this stuff and he turns out to be an absolute joke of a fight yeah Mm -hmm. I mean so he ended up being more of a joke character I was hoping for something a little more serious 
but he did stand out to me. And then, you know, just all throughout the world, there were fun little characters that were doing their own little thing. Like you had, you had treasure hunters, you had people looking for the flowers that symbolize love. I mean, you had adventurers. So it really, there were, even though they may have not had a big role, you could like imagine the stories that, you know, some of these other characters have, especially like you said, your adventures, your, your, your uh, vendors, your, your treasure hunters. Yeah. So, but none of them else, none of the other ones really stood out. You said the Sheikah, Cass, Master Koga were kind of the big ones, but kind of speaking of enemies there with Master Koga, what did you think of the new enemies that we really got in Breath of the Wild? Cause we've seen Boca Blends, we've seen Moblins, Liz Alphos, Wizards, we've seen all those yeah. in, in prior Zelda games. They had a nice twist. They had a nice look to them in Breath of the Wild. But let's talk about the new enemies in Breath of the Wild. What do you think about the new ones we got introduced to? Um, I thought the Guardians were pretty cool, really. Um, obviously, they <laughs> it took me forever to figure Ooh. out how to beat them because I could not parry worth a crap. Mm. So, like, you know, again, the Ancient Arrows, I think I did very later on, like, er, like very late in yeah. the game. So, kind of, really, the Guardians, while they were cool and, like, while I do like them being a mostly one-hit kill, like they just, I struggled because I didn't know how to beat them early on. Yeah. And so when I ran into them and I, it made me not explore parts of Hyrule. Like I really wanted to explore Central Hyrule in depth, and I just couldn't because there was always guardians out there. So yep. you know I liked them, but at the same time I didn't like them. Um, the Yiga, uh, you had the Foot Soldier and the Blade Master. Um, I kind of thought like you know that whole race and the whole culture of the Yiga. I thought that was a good change of pace and like going to the yeah. hideout. And just seeing how they were a little bit different. Like, I really liked that addition. And then, like we said earlier, you had that, uh, we didn't go into detail, but you had that Sheikah versus Yiga kind of comp, like, you know, a uh, story, like yeah, backstory going on behind it. So, yeah, I like that. And then you got some mini bosses. Like, we've seen some of these before the we Lionel, have. the Hennix, Talus, Malduga. Um, you know, I'm not really a huge fan of overworld bosses. Um, just like, you know, yeah, they're cool. You go, like, I, they get in my way. Like, you know, I'm not a patient guy. I want to go from A to B, and they really just more got in my way. But here and yeah. there, it was okay, like, you know, to fight them. But here's where I really did like a mini boss, and we're going to kind of, well, I don't know if you want to say anything about the enemies, but I think we should just kind of speed through that. Because you know yeah. what? It's a Zilla game. They fucking have enemies in the game. Um, yep. I kind of want to talk about the quest, and then I want to get some final thoughts and then wrap up, because we're kind of, we're getting way into this podcast. Yep. <laughs> it's okay, but we don't want our podcast to be too long. No. But the quest, you know, we got Shrine Quest. We got side quests. We're not going to go into all of them, but did you have any memorable ones, either side or shrine quests, that you really enjoyed in the game? Uh, well, too many of the side quests were just go get this or go get 10 of this or 50 of this. Like You call those like fetch quests and yeah. collection quests, and those aren't very memorable. Some of them had you go in and fight and like, hey, go take on this Hinox, go take on that Talus. Go take on a Mulduga. Like, that. those were fun. But the, the most memorable one, and we mentioned this earlier with Terrytown, from the ground up, I thought, was one of the yes. best side quests. I mean, just building up this whole town and then bringing together everyone for the ceremony at the end, I thought was such a great payoff. In my opinion, it's the best, like, cinematic moment in Breath of the Wild, even more so than any of the memories, any of the story stuff. Like, I loved the payoff at the end uh, from the ground up, you know, a few of the other ones were kind of nice. You know, you had like the legend of the seven heroines. Allegedly there was an eighth heroine. So you had to yeah. go find mm. that statue uh, finding the three sets of Leviathan bones kind of scattered across the world. That was cool. I thought was kind of interesting and just trying to imagine what those Leviathans were. And then the theories that have come with that of like, Oh, one of them's Levias, one of them's the wind fish. One yeah. of them's what mm-hmm. like, I like that. So, yeah. So I really like anything like that, that really stokes the conversation so those were the ones that really jumped out to me in terms of just the generic side quest. The shrine quest, though. Yep. The shrine quest, really, those were by far the strongest side quests. So, like I said, they were a little more complex than your typical, hey, go here and collect 10 of these. What were some of your favorite of the shrine quests in the game? Well, kind of taking it back to the enemies, like I was talking about, we had the three giant brothers. Where you fought, oh, like, you yes. know, a, a, an oldest kin, or an oldest Hennix, which was the oldest kin, and then a yeah. middle one, and then a youngest one. Like, even though it wasn't huge on the uh, mini bosses out in the open world, I did really like that shrine quest. And then you had the recital at Warbler's Nest. Like, I oh, absolutely loved one. that one. Go around Rito Village and just getting all these, um, I forgot what they were called, but... um. Little like just children, bringing, Rito. <laughs> yeah, just bringing them, like, all together to do this, like, recital and play music. Loved it. Strain on even tie. We usually hate weapons getting taken away from us, but kind of putting us out on the stranded island and like yeah. allows us to like kind of go through, get our weapons, fight enemies. It's 
beautiful as hell. Like I yeah. really liked that one. And then some others that kind of had like stolen heirloom, uh, spring of wisdom where he fought that dragon up in the air that had the mouse. Oh, that, that was, was awesome. One. The perfect drink. Um, first of all, just move the girl off of the uh, <laughs> thing in front of the shrine. Like that's all we had to do to get in the shrine. Yes. But anyways, we go get her a drink from the bar. That's really all that I like about that shrine quest. Was hey, that we any, went to a bar. Any, any quest that has us going to get a drink from the bar for yeah. a pretty girl, I'm on board with. Best quest ever. <laughs> yeah, and then like the last one that I had was the undefeated champ, where it was Sandsteel racing, basically racing yep. through the desert. Huge fan of that one. Um, we all we I'm gonna plug all our videos. We made a video for a top ten <laughs> shrine quest. We'll also put a link for that one in the description, yep. along with uh, the shrine quest or the, not shrine quest, the shrines, the shrines yep. that I already mentioned. And then we also have a divine beast ranking. I'll put all three of those links down in the description. But uh, definitely check Brent, them out. <laughs> did you have any more shrine quests that you wanted to talk about? No, those were the ones that definitely jumped out the most to me. I mean, Strain on Eventide was such a great throwback to Link's Awakening. You know, the recital at Warbler's Nest was just a, a great, like, feel-good quest. Yeah. You know, the... the Oh, sorry, excuse me. That beer is bubbling back up on me. The three giant brothers, you know, you get to fight the three Hinoxes. The Stolen Heirloom gave us a little more backstory on the Yiga and she, uh, Sheikah split. So, perfect drink we already talked about. So, yep. mm-hmm. so like, I, those were really the ones that jumped out to me. So, I mean, that's... That's really the meat of Breath of yeah. the Wild. I mean, the world is unbelievable. The stories, you know, hit or miss. But, you know, the gameplay is is as good as it gets and gives you so much freedom. The quest could use a little bit of work, but, you know, there were some good side quests. So when you take all that together, and I know we've kind of compared it a little bit to other open world games and also other Zelda games, but where, and you don't have to give an exact number or ranking or anything, but how do you think... Breath of the Wild really stacked up to other Zelda games and then maybe even other open world games from this generation. Um, I have it right now as number two. And like, you know, I kind of go back and forth on that a little bit. And the only reason I think it's that high, like I have a lot of issues with Breath of the Wild. But yeah. overall, I do think it's a very great game. But when you take that world, like that's what for me what makes it number two is just how big the world was, how beautiful it was, how much there was to do. And so, like I said, I have it at number two. But, like, you know, some days I'm kind of like, uh, but just that world right there, man. And, and all you could do, I think it deserves respect. Maybe it's not yeah. my favorite. And, like, you know, you can say, oh, well, you have it higher than Link to the Past or Twilight Princess or Skyward Sword. You know, yeah. But I think it's because, like I said, the world, it just had so much to it. So I it think did. it's like a big respect thing. But I don't think I always hold it number two. I think, you know, on certain days I might drop it down a little bit more. But, oh, yeah. you know, kind of in final thoughts, well, you know, what we're talking about right here. Breath of the Wild is very upsetting to me because <laughs> as I'm playing through it, like, you know, yeah, it's a great game. I enjoyed the hell out of it. But as I'm playing through it, like, you know, early on, I'm like, this can be easily the best Zelda game I ever played. And you just kept on hitting these things like, you know, the Divine Beast, you know, the disjointed story with like, you know, the memories and just like, you know, the, the quests. Yeah, there were there were some good ones, but there were a lot that were just like you said, fetch quests and stuff. And so, yeah. Early on, I was like, man, this is going to be the greatest Zelda game ever. And then as you're going through, like that kind of just went away. And that's why it's upsetting. Because yeah. I feel like it could have been the best Zelda game ever. But there's just so many things, like we said, like traditional dungeons, theme dungeons. Like, you know, your desert, your forest, your water. Like, it didn't have any of that. All the Divine Beasts were the same. The bosses are completely unforgettable. They're, like, they don't mean anything. For like, you sure. Know, they're just there. They're in the way. So, while it did a lot of great things and, like, you know, that's why it climbs up to number two. There's so many things that are wrong with it. And that's why it's not my favorite Zelda game. It's not your favorite Zelda game. And for a lot of Zelda fans, it's not their favorite Zelda game. So hopefully with the sequel, they correct some of these things and they do create the best Zelda game ever. Yeah. But what are some of your final thoughts? So, I mean, I generally agree with you. The world and everything you can do in it is so well done. And you can't take that yeah. away from this game at all. Like, the world is massive and beautiful. And the freedom you have to just mess around in that world is an achievement. But for someone, for both of us, we've both been playing Zelda games since, like, the early 90s. I mean, we've been playing since Link to the yeah. Past, basically. Mm-hmm. And we've gone back and played. There is no the basically. We've been that. playing since Link to the Past. Exactly. And so, to me... I'm all for trying to freshen things up and try to keep the series from getting stale. And Nintendo does great at that. I just think Breath of the Wild was too radical of a departure. Like, I'm all for trying the open world. But, you know, it was still missing some of those things that I think a Zelda game needs to make it a true Zelda game. And, you know, that's obviously just my opinion. There are people out there who's like, oh, who are you to say what a true Zelda game is? And I get that. I totally get that. But... 
like to me, it didn't have some of that structure. It didn't have the strong plot with like the progression. It didn't have the dungeon. So to me, it is an amazing achievement in terms of the world and what you can do in it. Yeah. But I don't even know if I'd put it in my top five Zelda games, to be yeah. completely honest. I mean, I just appreciate the structure of some of the older Zelda games so much yeah. more. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but that being said, though, it is I mentioned this at the very beginning. It is probably my favorite version of Hyrule. I mean, yeah. it's huge. It's gorgeous. And I'm hoping that there is now a like a skeleton upon which they can build the next one. Yeah. Like they mm-hmm. got the engine, they've got the world, they've got the assets, the art, all that. So now let's make that next step. Let's yeah. bring back some of this traditional Zelda. Give us some yeah, dungeons, yeah. give us some bosses, give us some items in yes. those dungeons. And then uh what was the other thing? Uh so give us some themes in those dungeons and give us a story. Yeah. That's all you need to do, Nintendo, and it will be the best <laughs> Zelda game ever. Yeah, but the structure is there now. Or like the uh, the, the foundation, I should yeah. say, not the structure. Mm-hmm. The foundation is there to build whatever the next one's called. I know everyone just keeps calling it Breath of the Wild 2, but I don't think they've ever just called something two since no. Zelda 2. So I'm sure it'll have a different name. But you know, and even it really came out in the middle of a golden age for open world games in general. I mean, Witcher 3. Horizon Zero Dawn, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Death Stranding. I know I'm leaving a ton more out there. Yeah. Like, I just feel like in terms of collectibles and side quests, it definitely lags behind some of those other games. So the foundation is there in that sequel. Let's see a little bit more strength in those areas we've talked about. And I do completely agree. I think the sequel could be, if they just, you know, do it right, could be the best Zelda game ever. But we have blabbed on long enough about <laughs> yeah. Breath of the Wild, so how about you go ahead and get us wrapped up? Uh, first of all, you can find all the links in the description for all this stuff, and also those three videos that Hell we yeah. mentioned earlier, but you can support us on Patreon or PayPal, and if you can't support us financially, please leave a review or a rating. It helps out with our rankings when people are searching for like you know video game podcasts. Yep. And we also have merchandise on our websites, Two Guys Playing Zelda, TGPC Gaming, and those are affiliate shops, so we may earn a commission uh, if you purchase through our links. It just depends if it tracks correctly or not. It doesn't right. always track correctly, so that's why we may earn a commission. Um, exactly. You want to kind of talk about our uh, face group? Facebook groups and what else we got going on. Yep. Well, we're all over social media. You mentioned Facebook. We've got uh, two uh, pages. We've got the gaming realm where we talk about all the games. Those are groups. Groups. Sorry, not pages. Sorry. We got two groups. We got gaming realm and we have Zelda realm where we talk specifically about Zelda, of course. Not to get cheesy red, but we also have two pages. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Go ahead. Oh my goodness. We're going to have to start putting more notes down here. Yeah. Uh, We also have YouTube. We've got two guys playing Zelda and TGPZ gaming. Go check us out on there. Lots of videos, rankings, theories, all that kind of stuff. Uh, We've got a discord server with a bunch of channels. We talk about just video gaming in general. We talk Nintendo, Sony, Xbox. We talk sports. We talk booze. We talk Star Wars. We talk just about everything on discord. And then you can find us on Twitter Instagram, on Facebook. Um, So I guess all that's left to do is decide what the hell we want to talk about in the next episode. So um, I'm kind of down for sticking with talking about some specific games here. I wouldn't mind getting away from Nintendo a little bit because we've already done Odyssey and and, and, uh, Breath of the Wild here. What do you think about something like uh, maybe Spider-Man or the original The Last of Us? Ooh, man. (laughs) I'm okay with both of those. Damn. (laughs) Uh, um, Tough decision. You know, I don't know if we say, because you got The Last of Us Part 2. You know, we might talk about those together because it's only two games. We could do that. Um, or we might not. I don't, you know, I can't make a decision right now, so I guess <laughs> we're going to talk about Spider Man uh, hey, on the PS4 next uh, episode. But, anyways, in the meantime, y'all stay safe. There's still that pandemic going on. We'll, uh, try to make more time for gaming, and we will catch you on the next episode. I hope y'all enjoyed this one. Zelda fans, I hope you loved it. We had a blast. See you next time.